started. Happy Wednesday. I thought we would break tradition and actually start with a song today. So maybe this will put everybody in a good mood. I'll be honest, this one doesn't have an awful lot of biochemistry and it has a little bit, okay, that we were talking about last time, which is why I thought about doing it. And made of the song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. Okay. You're good. That's what this one's all about. It's called Brain Farts Just Happen in My Head. <laughs> Brain farts just happen in my head. I think it might be due to something Kevin said. Biochemistry gets brain farts are popping in my head and they're popping. So I just wiped out the teardrop from my eyes and told my brain it had to do some mental exercise, burn some ATP, so brain farts can stop inside my head, they'll be stopping, cause there's one thing I've learned, when energy increases it sure pleases, my mental state I'm doing great as tension eases, da da da. Now brain farts don't happen in my head, so I'm sure the final will be easier instead. I like the AMP stops brain farts from popping in my head. They're not popping thanks to caffeine. Nothing's worrying me. Okay. <coughs> okay. Now we go back to something less exciting than that, signaling. And I think you're actually going to like signaling. You've seen some of the, the things so far, and you've seen how uh, signaling processes play very important roles in regulating uh, energy. And we're going to see uh, signaling play very important roles in all kinds of communication, including some very important decisions that cells have to make regarding whether or not to divide. So. Um, Last time I talked about the beta adrenergic receptor, uh, which is the one that binds epinephrine, and you saw the sort of effects of that binding of epinephrine. Now I'm going to move uh, our attention to another receptor uh, that uh, isn't named. Uh, there are several uh, different forms of this receptor. But this receptor activates a different signaling pathway. And the signaling pathway this other receptor activates is called um, the phospholipase C pathway. Okay? So, it's a little confusing because the pathway uh, that this one is involved in is involved in activating an enzyme that's making, okay, it's making second messengers. And in fact, it's making two second messengers. So this pathway is called the phospholipase C pathway, as I said. And the phospholipase C pathway is activating the enzyme known as phospholipase C. So binding of hormones to the receptor, which again I haven't named here, but the binding of the hormones to the receptor activates phospholipase C, and phospholipase C catalyzes this reaction that you can see here. Now, what's the significance of this reaction? This molecule right here is called, has a long name, it's called PIP2, and yes, you can use that abbreviation, okay, PIP2. PIP2 is a membrane phospholipid. We'll talk about phospholipids next term, but you've seen these before in general chemistry. And phospholipids have properties of having long, nonpolar tails and very polar heads. Okay? What phospholipase C does is it catalyzes the removal of that polar head. So here's the polar head getting cleaved off. The polar head, when it's cleaved off, has the name of IP3. Okay. What's left behind is something called diacylglycerol, which you can also call DAG. Now, this guy, DAG, is still stuck in the membrane. It's stuck in the nonpolar portion of the membrane. It acts, as we shall see, as a second messenger. In addition, IP3 acts as a second messenger, and you'll notice that it is not nonpolar. 
And in fact, it goes and moves into the cytoplasm. So IP3 will act as a second messenger, as we shall see. DAG acts as a, as a second messenger in the membrane of the cell. And we're going to see these two are actually coordinated in the overall pathway I'm going to show you in a second. So the main feature of this pathway is activating the enzyme phospholipase C. Okay, well let's look at what happens um, during the activation of this pathway. So what you've seen so far is phospholipase C gets activated, and that's shown schematically up here on the left. Here's phospholipase C. Here's PIP2. PIP2 is embedded in the membrane. Phospholipase C, when it becomes activated as a result of signaling, clips this IP3 off and leaves behind DAG. Now, these go two different directions. As I said, IP3 travels to a calcium storing structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You've heard of the endoplasmic reticulum, and it also will store calcium. In muscles, there's a specialized structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is holding calcium. Why is it holding calcium? Well, if you remember I said earlier in the term, too much calcium will cause your DNA to precipitate. So calcium is an important molecule, and cells use it for signaling, as we shall see, but you can't have too much of it present at any given time. So they sequester it. Calcium is also important if you study muscle physiology because hopefully you remember from your studies of muscle physiology that it's the release of calcium that triggers muscular contraction. So again, controlling how much calcium is present is important because you don't want the muscle constantly contracting, for example. All right, so let's go through the signaling steps now, now that you've seen the overall big picture. The signaling steps are phospholipase C becomes activated. It cleaves PIP2 into IP3 and into DAG. IP3 travels to the sarcoplasmic reticulum where it binds to a receptor, and that receptor opens as a consequence. So this receptor opens, and that opening of the receptor allows calcium to exit the sarcoplasmic reticulum and go to the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, Calcium interacts with this enzyme, protein kinase C. You can see the binding of, cal of, of calcium, the little green guys here, to the protein kinase C. Protein kinase C, as you note, sticks to membranes. And guess what it sticks to? DAG. So the joint activation of protein kinase C by this pathway leads to activation of protein kinase C, that is, the addition of calcium to it and the binding of this by day. So to activate protein kinase C, we have to have this whole process happen. And then you say, okay, so what happens next? What happens next is going to depend upon the cell in which this occurs. And protein kinase C, as its name suggests, is a kinase. It's going to phosphorylate other proteins. The phosphorylation of those proteins are going to, in some cases, turn them on, turn them off, and we're not going to follow the consequences of this one. The important thing is that we've got yet another way of communicating another signal inside of these cells. In many cases, what we will discover, and we're going to see this with the later pathways I'll be talking about, we discover that this, these protein kinase activations result ultimately in a response of the cell, and that response comes from the nucleus. We may be, for example, um, uh, turning on transcription of genes, turning off transcription of genes, causing translation to start or stop, et cetera. And we'll see how that goes in just a little bit. OK, questions about this? Yes, back in the back. So good question. Are IP3 and calcium both second, second messengers? In fact, the definition of them both is as second messengers, as is DAG. I said earlier I like to think of calcium almost as a third messenger because it depends on IP3 for it to be released. You can call it a second, you can call it a third for, uh, for either purpose as far as I'm concerned. But I, I think of calcium as sort of a third messenger, although that term, I, I'm, I think I'm the only person that uses that terminology. Yes? I 
So it's not, okay, so her question is, why does protein kinase C stick to the, stick to the membrane, basically? Is, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. And the answer is that protein kinase C has a binding site for DAG. And so this is just the way the protein kinase C gets activated. This will allow a kinase now to be active near the membrane. We'll see this will happen in other situations. And that can start a what's called a kinase cascade. It'll start phosphorylating a protein that phosphorylates another one that phosphorylates another one. So the only important thing about this is this just simply has binding sites for DAG, and DAG is going to be located in the membrane. And that's required to turn it on to bind. It is required. The binding of DAG um, by protein kinase C is required to turn it on. Uh -huh. Yes? So is the calcium is like activating the protein kinase C? I'm sorry? The binding of calcium to protein is activating that? So there's two things required to activate protein kinase C. One is the binding of calcium. The other is binding of DAG by the protein kinase C. So both of those are necessary to activate the, the uh, enzyme. Yes? I'm sorry? The, the numbers aren't, aren't, aren't relevant. So it, it, like any enzyme, this may cleave many of them. So this may cleave many PIP2s and create many IP3s, et cetera. Okay, well, that's uh, the phospholipase C uh, signaling pathway. By the way, the um, uh, receptor that's involved in this is also a 7TM, so both of the receptors we've talked about so far are 7TM receptors. Calcium, as I talked about, is uh, an important uh, molecule. As I said, it is uh, something that will precipitate DNA, so cells manage it uh, pretty carefully. And one of the ways that cells manage calcium is by using specific proteins with specific structures that hold on to calcium. So one of the ways of keeping the calcium concentration low is to use um, uh, calcium binding proteins uh, upon calcium release. One of these calcium binding proteins is very important. It's a very abundant protein in cells, and it's called calmodulin. That's called C-A-L-M-O-D-U-L-I-N. Calmodulin, like other calcium binding proteins, has a structure that we see across the spectrum. And so this structure is called EF hands. And it's called an EF hand because it schematically looks like what you see here, a finger sticking up and a place to bind the calcium, which is sort of here in the fingers of the hand. Okay? This structure we see over and over in different proteins, all of which bind calcium. Now, calmodulin is uh, important because calmodulin essentially, when it binds calcium, it changes structure. So a cell can tell if calmodulin has bound calcium or not bound calcium by the structure that the calmodulin has. So now we start thinking about ways that we can activate proteins without, in fact, actually using calcium we'll see that some of the enzymes in glycogen breakdown are activated when calcium is released, but they're not activated directly by calcium, they're activated by binding to calmodulin, which is bound to calcium. So when calmodulin has bound to calcium, the calcium concentration stays low, but the signal is still being communicated. That's a very, very useful way and a very effective way of keeping calcium concentrations relatively low and at the same time communicating a signal. These calcium binding proteins, like I say, have this structure called EF hands. Okay, I'll say more about calmodulin when we talk about glycogen enzymes, but it's a very common, here's, here's the uh, calmodulin, actually that's not calmodulin, that's something that binds to calmodulin. Here's calmodulin, you can see the sort of very uh, significant structural change that it goes in going from this structure over to this structure, and that's caused by the binding of calcium. This guy now is able to interact with enzymes in a way that this is not. That changes then, uh, again, telling the enzyme that calcium is present, we need to activate you, or in some cases, inactivate you. Okay, well, let's turn our attention back now to talking, <coughs> excuse me, more about uh, other signaling systems. And some of these other signaling systems have very big medical implications, as we shall see. Anti-cancer drugs, in some cases, um, uh, exploit the uh, knowledge about some of these other signaling pathways. One of these is um, 
a signaling pathway that works sort of counter to the pathway of the epinephrine pathway, and that's the insulin signaling pathway. So you remember that I said that uh, when uh, the body is needing energy and epinephrine is released, it stimulates the breakdown of glycogen. You may also remember I said that when you've eaten a meal and your blood glucose levels go high, glucose is a poison, so the body then uh, releases insulin as a way of taking up that, that blood glucose and keeping it from being a poison. So understanding what is happening in insulin signaling is very, very important to understanding, again, how the body is responding to these various things. Insulin is a, a, a peptide hormone, meaning it's uh, obviously a protein. Its structure is shown here, and it contains two chains, and I've, you've seen this before, but I'll remind you, two chains that are joined together in the middle by disulfide bonds. Okay. Insulin exerts its actions by binding to a cell surface receptor. Not surprisingly, the name of that cell surface receptor is the insulin receptor. Okay. So we're going to focus our attention on what happens with the insulin receptor. What's the signaling that's going on through the insulin receptor? This is a schematic representation of the insulin receptor. The insulin receptor is, not surprisingly, embedded in the lipid bilayer. This is the first receptor that we've talked about now that, does not, that is not a 7TM. So this is not a 7TM at all. It is a transmembrane protein, but it's just not a 7TM transmembrane protein. The way it's drawn, you see it contains two identical sets of two units, a left unit and a right unit, and they're essentially identical to each other. The insulin receptor exists in the membrane in what's called a dimeric form. meaning the left one associates with the right one. Now, importantly, in the natural state without insulin, those two sets of subunits sit in very close proximity to each other and don't do anything. Okay? They don't do anything, and they don't do anything until insulin binds. Insulin binding causes this dimer to interact, the, each, each subunit to interact with the other one differently than it did before. So they're sitting here doing nothing. Insulin binds. Now they're, they're, their shape has changed very slightly. And that sh slight change in shape, can't say it, the slight change in shape now causes everything to happen that we're going to see happen. Okay. All right. The insulin binding site, not surprisingly, is, is on the outside of the cell because, again, we're trying to communicate the information inside. The cell binds insulin. And it turns out that the insulin receptor is an enzyme. It's not active as an enzyme until insulin binds. Okay? So the insulin receptor is an enzyme. It's not active as an enzyme until insulin binds. When insulin binds, as I said, the interaction between these subunits changes very slightly. The activity of, one, of, the, of the two subunits is something known as a tyrosine kinase. A tyrosine kinase is a kinase, obviously, and a kinase is something that puts phosphates onto something. So a tyrosine kinase is an enzyme that puts phosphates onto tyrosines of other proteins. Okay? So... The insulin receptor is a tyrosine kinase. This is an enzyme that puts phosphates onto tyrosines of other proteins. Now, the insulin receptor is interesting. It is generally only active when it has phosphates on its tyrosines. What you see here has no phosphates on its tyrosines. The two sets of subunits are sitting here, twiddling their thumbs, minding their own business, doing nothing. Insulin binds, and each of these guys has an active site. The binding of insulin causes the tyrosine 
of one of the subunits to literally get inserted into the active site of the other one. This is the structural change that's occurring. So slight change in structure. This tyrosine now is placed into, physically, into the active site of the other one. This allows the active site of the other one, which normally wouldn't be active, to put a phosphate onto the tyrosine that's just been placed into it. Doing that, we've made, for example, the left side now, its tyrosine kinase is active. Guess what it does? It phosphorylates the tyrosine on the right side. So now they're both active. And they start phosphorylating the heck out of each other and out of other things. Okay? Blah, blah. So we have seen here, we have the inactive form. We see that upon activation, we are actually changing structure here. And we see that the change in structure coincides with phosphorylation of tyrosines that we have here. Let me show you that schematically. Okay, that's not what I want. Schematically, what's happening is this. Insulin has bound. The tyrosine of one side got literally stuck into the active site of the other one, causing it to be active. That in turn phosphorylated back and forth, and you can see several phosphates got, uh, several tyrosines got phosphate put onto them. The receptor at that point is fully active. The receptor will phosphorylate other things, including this protein called IRS1, which happens to be loaded with tyrosines. So IRS1 gains a bunch of phosphates, and IRS1 has a binding site for phosphotyrosine, which is what it's bound up here. So IRS1 has gotten phosphorylated, and it is bound to a phosphotyrosine. Notice that the phosphotyrosine here is acting as an anchor. It's provided a binding site for IRS1. There's also an IRS2. We won't go, th go through that here, OK? IRS1 has a structural domain called SH2. Doesn't matter what it stands for for the moment. We'll just call it SH2. SH2 is a structure we find in many uh, proteins involved in signaling. And SH2 binds to phosphotyrosine residues. So we have an SH2 domain that's part of IRS1. That's why it's binding to this phosphotyrosine and why it ends up being stuck here. Another portion of IRS1 is binding to this thing, PIP2. You've seen PIP2. PIP2 is a membrane phospholipid. So it's, this is providing now an anchor for this guy to stay at the membrane, as is this. So IRS1 is going to be held right next to the insulin receptor. It's going to be held at the membrane. And these phosphotyrosines that are on IRS1, guess what? are bound by an SH2 domain of phosphoinositide 3 kinase. Binding causes that enzyme to become active. When that enzyme becomes active, what it does is it puts a phosphate onto PIP2 to make PIP3. I told you it's a sequential process. PIP3 is a binding site for another kinase. Okay to become activated. It phosphorylates yet another kinase. And this kinase now can go and phosphorylate a lot of things. The signaling process has, has started with insulin. It's caused this sequential series of events to happen that's resulting, in this case, with activation of a kinase called AKT. Okay? I'm not quite to the end of the story yet, but if I am as far as this figure is concerned. Questions on this figure before I tell you the rest of the story? Yes, Lori. What are the phosphates on the receptor that are not down below that site? The anchor phosphates? How do they get put on? How do the phosphates uh, here? So these, okay, so our question is how, 
do, does the insulin receptor, how do all the phosphates get on there? And they literally get on there by sort of the active site of the other phosphorylating each other. Even the ones that are up there, that's right. Okay? So you see these, as I said, these phosphotyrosine, uh, this, this tyrosine kinase is very active. It will phosphorylate a lot of things. Yes, Mohammed. You're talking about the one of the Okay, so the, the initial activation that's happening after binding of insulin is that a phosphotyrosine of one of these is literally shoved into the active site of the other, causing it to get a phosphate. After this phosphate, then they separate? No, the, it never separates, okay? So this, this stays as a dimer. But now because th this guy's got a phosphate on it and it's very active, it's going to start phosphorylating this one, which phosphorylates back and forth and back and forth, which is how you get all these phosphates on here. Okay? Yes. The green blob. <laughs> yes, I will. Okay. So what we're looking at is a series of events that's happening. One going to the next, going to the next. First event was binding of the, of the insulin to the receptor. Second was the activation of the receptor by phosphorylation. Third was the binding to the phosphorylated receptor by IRS1. The next step was the binding of the, um, the green blob to, uh, I'm going to officially call that the green blob, okay? If you guys call it the green blob on the exam, I'll give you credit, okay? <laughs> all right. Binding of the green blob to IRS1, and these are all necessary steps for the activation. If this can't bind to this, then the green blob isn't active, okay? This activates the green blob, which in turn causes PIP2 to be phosphorylated to make PIP3. PIP3 is a binding site for uh, this PDK. PDK becomes activated and it phosphorylates AKT. So a sequ sequential set of events, and these things happen very rapidly, I should point out too. Yes, sir? I'm confused then about SH2. SH2 is simply a structural domain okay. that's, that recognizes phosphotyrosine. So that's a structural piece of this protein. It's a structural piece of this protein. Okay. Make sense? So it basically recognizes the phosphate. It recognizes phosphotyrosine. Okay. Not just phosphate, but phosphotyrosine. Yes? So when DP1 uh, binds to this PIP3, how does it end in the right activation of Okay. So his question is when PDK binds um, to PIP3, is this a, 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 a would you say, an Indirect activation? No, it's not. So this is this guy is activated by the binding of PIP3. This is a kinase. So this kinase now becomes active and it phosphorylates AKT to make the, an activated form of AKT. It's not a passive thing at all. It's not a byproduct. It is a result of catalytic action of this enzyme, which has become active from binding the PIP3. If there's no PIP3, this guy isn't active and this doesn't happen. Make sense? No? <laughs> He's honest, okay. So let me, let me answer his question here. Yeah. So I'm still trying to figure out where ATP is and then ATP. I thought that's kind of separate from ATP. Okay. So all this is, all that PDK is, is a kinase. It can exist in the inactive form or it can exist in the active form. If there's no PIP3, it's inactive. Nothing happens to AKT. All right. If if PDK binds PIP3, the kinase activity is active, and a kinase is going to put phosphate onto something. The something it puts phosphate onto is AKT to make this. This now is active. Make sense? Okay. You got a question? Yeah. I was just wondering, does PIP3 um, phosphorylate PDK, or does it just have to be bound? PDK has to be bound to PIP3 in order to be active. Okay. So notice that PIP3 up here is a molecule. So PIP3 is just, is just something that PDK is binding. What they're showing you is what the name stands for, PIP3-dependent protein kinase. That's why it's called PDK1. This is not PIP3. This is PIP3. Okay? So PDK is binding to PIP3. And that activates it. Yes, Mohammed. Is AKT binding to PDK1? 
is AKT binding to PDK1 to get phosphorylated. Well, like any enzyme, this is going to need to bind to what it's going to phosphorylate to make that happen. Yes. Okay. So when, that, when, they, when this guy hits this guy, it puts a phosphate on it if it's bound to PIP3. Yes. Okay, what's the purpose? Okay, why is it so complicated, basically, is what you're saying. And it's so complicated because each step is a necessary step for the next one. If there's no IRS1 to bind to, this guy won't become active. Oh, good, good question. There's other considerations in the binding besides phosphotyrosine. Okay, so phosphotyrosine is part of a structure that it recognizes. So in other words, the phosphotyrosine that's on this guy won't be recognized by the phosphotyrosine that's on here. Okay, good, good question, very good question. Okay, now, you see signaling happens, and we're, we're only touching a piece of signaling. Signaling is a, is a major set of sequential events over and over and over, and each one depends on the previous one. So as I said, if I stop the, uh, if I stop the phosphorylation of IRS1, or if a cell is lacking IRS1, then none of this is going to happen. Okay? If I stop the production of PIP3, then this isn't going to be activated and this isn't going to happen. If I have a mutant insulin receptor that can't bind insulin, none of this will happen. Okay? Yes? I'm sorry? Is there a one-to-one -one ratio? Okay, so... Um, the answer is no, it's not really a one-to-one -one ratio, although we certainly draw this going to this going to this. For each of these, there is a one-to-one -one ratio here, but by the time you get down here, this guy is now an active enzyme that's floating around the cell. It's going to phosphorylate a lot of things, and that's what I'm just getting ready to talk about. Okay? So what we've done so far is we've basically activated AKT. That's what we've done. Binding of insulin has activated AKT. AKT is a phosphate... Uh, I'm sorry, it's a kinase that is floating around the cytoplasm, and it's going to start phosphorylating things. One of the things that's going to happen when AKT starts phosphorylating things is it's going to change what's called trafficking inside of the cell. Okay? Trafficking inside of the cell means how things move in the cell. You probably never thought about it before, but there's all kinds of transport that has to happen of things inside of cells. Remember how I said that we have these little ID tags that get put onto proteins and tell the cell where they're destined to go? We had ID tags that said that went to the nucleus. We had ID tags that said that the protein was supposed to go outside the cell. ID tags that said protein was supposed to go into a membrane, etc. What, what we're talking about there is trafficking, how those proteins are moving. Phosphorylation through AKT changes the traffic pattern for a very important protein, for a very important set of proteins, actually. And the very important set of proteins are called GLUTs, G-L-U-T. Without the signaling process, GLUTs just make a glut in the cytoplasm. They just float around the cytoplasm doing nothing. When AKT gets phosphorylated, what happens is GLUT gets moved to the membrane of the cell, and GLUT stands for glucose transporter. So now we see the significance of, the move, of, of all that phosphorylation. And what, it's try, what the cell is trying to do is it's trying to move GLUTs to the membrane so the cell can start taking up glucose. Now we know why stimulation by insulin causes cells to take up glucose and drop blood glucose levels. Because when you put gluts there, they start pulling glucose out of the bloodstream. Pretty cool. Make sense? Questions about that? Yes, sir. Glucose needs a protein to get into cells, yes. So, 
So gluts are, are floating around the cytoplasm until the trafficking is changed and they're put on the cell surface. That's right. Now, the other thing that happens with this, and we'll talk about it with glycogen synthesis, but insulin stimulation is doing other things besides bringing glucose in the cell. Remember, glucose is a poison, and if all we did was bring glucose in the cell, we'd kill the cell. Not a good idea. Not a good career move. The other thing that insulin stimulates through a related pathway is it stimulates the synthesis of glycogen, which takes those glucoses and builds them into bigger structures. So just as it stimulates the uptake of glucose, similarly it stimulates the synthesis of glycogen using that glucose. So glucose doesn't stay in high concentration inside of cells. Because they're not. Make sense? Okay, now signaling, you, it's very easy to lose the forest for the trees. My God, there's all this stuff here. This goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, goes to this. And yes, you do need to know that. But the big picture is what's happening. Insulin has caused cells to take up glucose. Insulin has stimulated cells to use that glucose to make glycogen. Very, very important thing. Okay, well, let's go to another signaling pathway that we'll see has a little bit of a relationship to the insulin stimulating pathway. This is a pathway that is involved in what is called a growth factor. Growth factors are proteins that the body makes to stimulate cellular division, the growth of the organism. So growth factors are hormones that stimulate that process. We're going to see a little bit about how that process occurs by studying a growth hormone and its receptor called the epidermal growth factor, or EGF. If we look at the epidermal growth factor receptor, and again, the epidermal growth factor itself is a protein. There's the growth factor, which I had labeled wrong. There's a structural. Here's the growth factor receptor. Well, that, I keep. that is what it looks like, okay? But it's probably easy to understand, easier to understand it if we look at this. The epidermal growth factor receptor is schematically drawn very much like the insulin receptor. There are differences. One difference is that the epidermal growth factor does not start out as a dimer. It starts out as a monomer. So when we start this signaling process, the left half is not talking to the right half. In fact, they have no way of talking to each other until each one binds to an epidermal growth factor protein. So in the absence of epidermal growth factor protein, they won't, I mean, they'll just be floating around in the membrane of the cell, doing nothing. When they each bind to an epidermal growth factor protein, a structural change happens in each one of them, and the structural change in ca causes release of these two little loops that you see up here. These two loops are nonpolar regions that have affinity for each other. So the binding of the epidermal growth factor to the epidermal growth factor receptor causes the receptor to change shape, to release these loops that now interact with each other. And we've made, in this case, a dimer. Without epidermal growth factor, we do not have a dimer. OK, well, we start to see another signaling process. Here we go. Dimerization, guess what? Epidermal growth factor is a tyrosine protein kinase. Very similar thing going on with this kinase that we saw with the insulin receptor. That is, they phosphorylate each other and cause each other to become active. You've heard that before. These kinases phosphorylate um, other things, and mainly each other in this case. And the phosphotyrosine here provides a binding site for a protein called GERB2. GERB2 has an SH2 domain. It also has something called an SH3 domain, which doesn't really matter. An SH3 doesn't bind phosphotyrosine. It binds to another protein called SOS. SOS binds to a protein called RAS. And RAS is a protein I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about because it's a fascinating protein. RAS is the key to this activation pathway. All right? So 
binding, change of shape, dimerization, phosphorylation, basically construction, construction of this structure here. And now what we're seeing is activation of RAS. RAS is a G protein-like protein. It is a G protein in the sense that it binds guanine nucleotides, which you've seen before. It is a G protein in that the activation of this pathway causes GDP to be replaced by GTP. And GTP activates RAS. Now, your book goes through a long signaling pathway that RAS stimulates that I'm not going to go through and you're not going to be responsible for. I want you to see the big picture here. And the big picture is that RAS activates a series of things that stimulate the cell to divide. Activated RAS is going to ultimately stimulate the cell to divide. This is how epidermal growth factor responds to epidermal, uh, how epidermal growth factor stimulates the cell ultimately to divide by activating RAS. Now, RAS is, as I said, a very interesting protein. It is a protein that is known as an oncogene. We haven't used that term so far. So an oncogene is a protein whose normal function is very intimately involved in controlling cellular decisions. In this case, the decision to divide or not divide. So I'll repeat that. An oncogene is a protein that's intimately involved in important cellular decisions. The term needs some definition, and it's frequently confused, so I want to point this out to you. When we use the term oncogene, typically we're referring to something called a, uh, a mutated form of another gene. What does that mean? Okay. Cellular genes okay, play important roles in controlling decisions to divide, decisions to make glycogen, to make all these various things that are necessary, and they participate in the signaling process. Okay. If we change them in some way so that they don't respond in the way that they did before, we can imagine we could cause some problems. I'll give you a real good example with RAS. RAS is an oncogene. An oncogene is a protein, a mutated form of a protein that causes cells to divide uncontrollably. You've heard of oncology, oncology relating to cancer. An oncogene is a gene that causes cells to divide uncontrollably. Well, you're loaded with these genes. How come you're not dividing uncontrollably? Because they are under control. They haven't mutated. They haven't done any. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're making those appropriate decisions. They're responding appropriately. What if I mutate RAS? There is a mutation of RAS that is known. It's found in many, many cancers. The mutation affects amino acid number 10 or 11 inside of RAS. You don't need to know that. When scientists looked to see what that mutation did, they discovered that it eliminated the ability of that RAS to break GTP down to GDP. So once that mutant RAS bound GTP, guess what? It was always on. The cell was always stimulated to divide. And that's our definition of a cancer. It turns out that if you change the amino acid at that position in RAS to any other amino acid, you will create a RAS that will be an oncogene. When I get thinking about environmental pollution and mutation, and I think of the fact that the change of a single base pair in my DNA can cause creation of a protein that is going to cause my cells to divide uncontrollably, I get a little nervous. And you say, oh, well, it's all one base pair out of a billion. You don't worry about that, right? One base pair out of a billion, that's a chance of one in a billion. Man, I'll live forever. That's fine until you consider you have several trillion cells that have divided. Take a, billion and, take a trillion and divide it by a billion, you'll get a thousand. Some cells you have 
are going to go through that mutation. Okay? Not a good thing. Now, let me come back to that. I started to define a term and I got away from that. The term I wanted to define is what is the unmutated form of the protein called? RAS in its normal function does great job. It helps the cell make those appropriate decisions about when to divide and not to divide. It's only in the mutated form that we call it an oncogene. The unmutated form is called a proto-oncogene. So proto-oncogene is an unmutated form of a, an oncogene. They must not like my lecture. Okay. If you mutate a proto-oncogene, you can create an oncogene. An oncogene can cause a cell to go out of control and have significant problems. Everybody, everybody got me? Makes sense? RAS is a very important protein. RAS is activated in many, many, many pathways. This is one of hundreds. One of hundreds. There's hundreds of different ways of controlling RAS. The signaling process is very, very complicated. So I'm giving you an abbreviated, simplified version right here. OK, questions about RAS? Lori? Sure. How does RAS get stuck in the activated state? If RAS is mutated so that you change amino acids 10 or 11, okay, it is no longer able to cleave GTP and make GDP. So once you load it with GTP here, it's always got GTP. And in this state, it's telling the cell to divide. It can't turn its own signal off. Remember in the case of the G proteins earlier, they were able to turn themselves off by cleaving GTP to make GDP. That turned them off. The same thing with RAS normally, but if I mutate RAS so that I can't do that, RAS is left in the on state. That cell is going to be told to divide forever. Question back there? Do you have a question? Okay. Okay, we've got about five minutes, and I'm stepping on my shoelace here. Uh, let's look at uh, another aspect of this, okay? Um, actually, let me leave it right there. Abnormal growth factor receptor is interesting. Notice how we have, uh, it took the dimerization for this whole process to happen. If we can't dimerize it, we can't make this happen. The question is, what if I were to cause this to flip out without binding EGF? Would I activate the EGF receptor? And it turns out that you will. It turns out that you will. Now, I've got to tell you a bit of a story with this. The story is that there's another receptor that looks very much like the EGF receptor. It's called HER, H-E-R. It's present in all of your cells. And HER has this little loop sticking out without binding to EGF. Why aren't all of your cells dividing out of control? Well, there's a numbers game. You have a certain number of HERs that are there. And some activation of RAS and some activation of cells is probably going on because your cells are dividing, and that's a very natural thing for them to do. In the normal scheme of things, the amount of HER that you have that's interacting with EGF is causing a certain low-level stimulation of RAS and causing cells to periodically divide, and everything's fine and dandy. If you make a mutation such that your cells start making an awful lot of HER, What's going to happen? You're going to upset that balance. You're going to start activating a lot more RAS. And you're going to stimulate uncontrolled cellular division simply by making too much HER. This phenomenon is a, is a major contributor to breast cancer. About 30% of breast cancers have overstimulated amounts of HER meaning that they're making too many EGF dimers that are out of control that are now activating too much RAS and causing too much cell division. Okay, So here's yet another way that we can get out of control. We screw up the signaling through the receptor. We're getting too much signal. The cell is being told too frequently to activate RAS and divide. Fortunately, there's an amazing anti-cancer drug that has been designed, it's a monoclonal antibody called Herceptin. Herceptin binds to HER, and it keeps it from dimerizing with RAS. 
uh, I'm sorry, dimerizing with EGF receptor, which therefore causes a normal amount of stimulation of RAS to occur. The cancer itself dies out. It's very effective. It has very few side effects, and it's very effective in treating some types of breast and other types of cancer. Anything that has problems with the EGF receptor due to overstimulation of her will respond to her septum. Okay, so this is a place where we see that our knowledge of signaling allows us to design drugs to stop uncontrolled growth. We're going to see other examples when I start the lecture on Friday. See you guys then. Well, because what's, what's happening is they're not under any control whatsoever. They, they're going to take up all the nutrients. They're going to starve. That's making the tumor that ultimately will just uh, take over everything else. Oh, see, I'm, this. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but you, you know what metastasizing is, for example, right? Metastasizing when a tumor lets go of all these connections and it goes everywhere. The tumor cells are dividing rapidly. They're taking over everything. You lose control that's otherwise there as a result of that. Make sense? Hey, Andy. How hey. you doing? Get this thing up here. This oh, level. here. I, I like it the way it is. Oh. I just want to. So you, when I come in, it's down, but I just lift and, and just like it's that. It's a combination okay. of the two, yeah. All right. Yeah, I usually leave it in the state. I hope, yeah, hope it's not in your way. No, that's what I like. So that, that's working okay. That, okay. that was working fine. That's and good because this thing wasn't. I wonder if they fixed it. Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah. How you doing? Hi, good. How are you? Good. You have questions? Yeah. Okay, um, let's go back this way. Okay. About the rat pathway. Okay. Um, 